scripture, but I just want to do a declaration while we're standing together, and I'll, I'll give you the, the scriptures that we're going to just quote. But it's a prayer, so we can, we can receive it in the first person. Amen? We'll read it out loud together, but receive it as a prayer for us today, right now. There's never going to be another right now. That one just passed, and we're in this one now, right? So we've got this limited time that we're here, and he's the God of the present. He, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he wants us to come fully alive in him. And this is one of the ways that we do it, is just by interacting between heaven and earth. Amen? So read it out loud together with me. Ready? Ephesians 1.17 in the voice. God of our Lord Jesus, the anointed, Father of glory, I call out to you on behalf of your people. Give them minds ready to receive wisdom and revelation so they will truly know you. Open the eyes of their hearts and let the light of your truth flood in. Shine your light on the hope you are calling them to embrace. Reveal to them the glorious riches you are preparing as their inheritance. Let them see the full extent of your power that is at work in those of us who believe. And may it be done according to your might and your power. Let's say that part again. And may it be done according to your might and your power. One more time. And may it be done according to your might and your power. Lord, we expect to receive something today. And we know you will not cut short our expectations. We know when we break the bread of life open together and we receive that revelation that you give us, we are never the same. And we make the statement that we are not leaving the same way that we walked in. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom, there's an understanding that this life with all its trials and tribulations is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us and through us in eternity as we spend it with you. I pray, Lord, that you would touch your people today with the truth of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. That's good. Now it's official. <laughs> I gave it the title, Give Me More Faith in God's Power Than Man's Wisdom. And while I was studying, this verse on the right just kept coming up to me. I saw Satan fall like lightning. How many excited about that? How many know that Satan is still falling like lightning every time God's people operate in the natural realm? For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. Come on. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Say it. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. That he might destroy the works of the devil. So every time we operate in the power of God, he's destroying the works of the devil through us. Every time someone gets saved, every time someone gets healed, every time there's a prophetic word that, that touches somebody. So I'll even give you an example from yesterday. There was a guy that came over. I was sitting there help, trying to, you know, oversee the booth. And I worked in New York for a long time, so I, I made sure none of the gear was close enough for somebody to lean over the fence and steal it. You know, like, you got to think like this. I hate to say it, but you got to think like this. So he came over and he said, how long has that girl been singing the same song? I said, I think it's about 20 minutes. How does she have so much lung capacity to keep singing like that? Does she have some special gift? I said, well, she has the gift of the Holy Spirit. And she's not up there to perform. She's up there ministering to the Lord and asking his presence to fill this whole place. And he goes, I, I was baptized two weeks ago as a first-time Christian. I don't know. He's probably 50 years old. And, and I never heard any music like that before. So he had just, just brand new saved two weeks ago and baptized. And, and long story short, I was able to unpack a whole bunch of stuff for him that was really confusing. And I said to him, if for no other reason than me and you meeting today, this whole event was worth it. That's how much God cares about every person. And, and it was like his eyes just kept lighting up that, that there was just a whole new direction for him. In, in the midst of all the opposition, that's, that's who I want to be. I don't know if that's who you want to be. And I don't know how necessarily great we are at it. But part of the truth of the word is he's not counting on our ability. He's just counting on our availability. 
that's not always so easy because we get hung up in the cultural stuff and we don't want to look foolish. And Paul said, I'm a fool for Christ. I'm good with that. I'm, a, I'm good with that. Everybody's following somebody's pattern, somebody's worldview, or Oprah or whoever else. They're following somebody, even if they might not identify it. But we, we know who we follow. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. We trust in the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into that name, and they are safe. I will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Right? How about you? I saw Satan fall like lightning. He was so happy. The Lord sent them out, sent the 70 out, and they came back and said, even the demons are subject to the authority that you've delegated to us. Anybody here have any delegated authority from the Lord? Yeah. Good, me too. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 2. I gave it a little subtitle called Kingdoms in Conflict because that's really the, the thing. There's a kingdom of God and then there's a kingdom of the enemy. There's light and darkness. There's freedom and there's oppression. And, and we got to make a choice what we're going to do. So this is where the text comes from, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. The sermons I preach were not delivered with the kind of persuasive elegance some may expect. I didn't come to you with fancy language. He was writing a letter to Corinth, and this was a very secular city. They, they were much like Athens, actually very close to Athens, and they just were having a hard time understanding everything that Paul was trying to give them while he was there. And you, know, you could see a lot of corrective language in these two letters, but there was also another group of people trying to come in and convince the Corinthians that Paul was, because he wasn't a good speaker, he wasn't the person that they should be following. Amen? Anybody ever happen? Have that happen to you? Get put down because you don't have the right education or the right degree or whatever. But you have the Holy Spirit, right? You've got the power of God on the inside of you. So they were being deceived. And that's what he's referring to here. The sermons I preached might not have been delivered with the kind of persuasive elegance that some other people might expect. But they were effective because I relied on God's Spirit to demonstrate God's power. And I think that's another good confession that we could all say is I rely on God's spirit to demonstrate God's power. <laughs> if this were not so, your faith would be based on human wisdom and not the power of God. So Lord, give me more faith in your power than in man's wisdom. And just again, personally, in my world of the work that I do with finance in New York City and people from all over the world that are coming and make a lot of money, there's a big stronghold of man's wisdom and counting on man's wisdom for everything and you can barely get a word in. Scientists have this problem too because they're taught in school that if you can't reproduce the results, if you can't prove it, it's not really science. So how could you believe in God if you can't prove it? Well, I can prove it because I once was lost and now I see. <laughs> but man's wisdom, you know, even the Pharisees were saying, well, how did it happen? How did he do it? I don't know. I just know I've been blind. This morning when I had breakfast, I couldn't see my eggs. <laughs> I walked out the door blind. I walked back home and I could see. So I don't know who did it. I don't know how he did it, but I know who did it. That's the best thing. That's your testimony. When Mario Murillo was here, he, he talked about a, a radio show back in the day. Yeah, I know. He's old. He said he was born in the year 19, none of your business. When they used to only have radio shows, like, no, not quite. He had TV, but this particular show was one of the best apologetic ministers in the world. And he would debate atheists, and the atheists would bring all of their, you know, top-level people. And, and this man wouldn't tell the show who he was going to bring for his side of the argument. And he always would bring brand-new believers, people who had just been saved. And there was all these people on one side with all their degrees about why God this, why that. And, and the guy would just say, well, well, what's your story? Well, I was on drugs and all I called out to God. I was dying on the green in Marstown and God made himself real to me and here I am. I don't know how he did it, but I know he did it. Because nothing else I ever did worked until I called out to him. And don't you think we can overcomplicate this sometimes? I rely on God's spirit to demonstrate God's power. If this were not so, then your faith would be based on human wisdom and not the power of God. And I'm not against human wisdom, of course, right? I mean, I, our son is a scientist, just got his PhD 
sent me the final paper yesterday. Like, hallelujah, seven years it took him. Cancer research. I'm not against any of that stuff. God gives us this gift to solve problems. Crafty inventions. Like, who should be better at this than the people are connected to the creator of the whole universe? We should be coming up with the best ideas, and often we do, especially when you understand that the marketplace is just as, uh, it's just as obvious a place to do ministry as everywhere else. Bring what you learned through the Lord into your job. You're only going to prosper. Maybe not in the short run. You might be persecuted, but that's okay. He's got your back. He's got your front. He's got your top, your bottom, left, right, everywhere you look, he's got you. And this is what I talked about already, Luke 10, 17. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. <laughs> I was addicted for 10 years. I tried every program in the world. It would work for a little while. I could stop under my own willpower. I could stop. But then something would come along to derail me, and I would start using it again. And AA, they call it picking up. I picked up and went back to it again. And it's the pressure of life that something happens and it causes you to get back on off the wagon, right? That's another way people would say it. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. And one of the things I said to this man who had just gotten saved two weeks ago and was very new, I said, for my testimony, it wasn't so much that I got convinced by a sermon. I was convinced by the actions of a Christian. I was, I was watching very closely my mother who was a Christian who was saved and I wasn't. And it wasn't anything she said, even though she did speak to me. It wasn't what she said. It was the amount of tools that she had to cope with a tragedy that I knew I didn't have. And I couldn't have given it language at the time, but now I know it was the presence of God in her life. And look, if you believe that God poured out his spirit on all flesh, then sometimes it might just be an activation happens, right? It says one plants, another waters, God gives the increase. So maybe, can't prove it, that, that spark that was deposited in all flesh gets lighted up under the right circumstances, right? You can't control how it happens. You may not feel like you're very good at it, but by making yourself available, you have no way of knowing the impact you're having on other people just as they watch you and the way you live your life. And that's the power of God. That's the power of God. That's carrying anointing into your life that you don't have to scream when you pray for people to get healed. He didn't. Jesus really didn't do that. Look it up sometime, the prayers of Jesus. They're very short. Come out. <laughs> Two words. Come out. He had authority. Come out. 18. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority. Now look at the person next to you. Say, he gave you the authority. To trample on serpents and scorpions. Oh, that's good authority. Over all the power of the enemy. Not some of the power of the enemy. Over all the power of the enemy. Give me more faith in your power, Lord, and in my human wisdom. Help me stop trying to figure things out how you're doing it. Let's get the how out of here. That was Joseph Garlington. He had shirts printed up. Get the how out of here. <laughs> and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's challenging, I know. Like the first thing our logical mind does is say, what about that time this happened? What about the time this happened? Well, maybe there's a part of it that's on our side of the ledger and that we have to look in the mirror and say, am I just giving you lip service that I believe? Do I really believe or am I just saying I believe? But when, when the rubber meets the road, I default back to my human wisdom again. And that's not meant to put shame on people, right? Because when you're growing, if you have somebody who's only been taking piano lessons two weeks, they're going to make a lot of mistakes. Right now, 25 years later, maybe they shouldn't be making those basic mistakes, but there's a process of growing in, in our maturity with the Lord. And everybody's so different. So I'm not saying that if you prayed for somebody and they died and you wanted them to live, that you failed. But I am saying, don't be discouraged by that. We have to Start by saying, Lord, I know it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by your spirit. Any education I get has to say submitted your, to your power. I want the education. I want to know what scripture means. It says study to show yourself approved. But my logic can't compete with God's power. 
it just won't. There is nobody smart enough in the world to do that. Mark 16, 14, Jesus rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Who was he talking to? The disciples. Oh, it was one of those rough reviews when you go in and talk to your boss. <laughs> they don't make a love sandwich and tell you all the good stuff first and then criticize you and then give you a compliment on the way out, right? It's like, no, after he rose from the dead, the women that went to the tomb and saw him came running back to talk to the disciples, and they didn't believe them. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Again, I'm not trying to shame the apostles because their human logic was sitting in the seat of decision-making, not a belief in the power of God. And look, you know, if he could turn water into wine, he can create the whole universe. Before Abraham was, I am. Then faith means I have to believe it before, it, before I'm going to see it happen. How many people remember the Colorado shooting um, at the high school? Uh, yeah. Say it again. Columbine. Columbine. Yeah, the high school. And I mean, that was just the most horrible tragedy that you could think of. And that one young girl who... You know, people heard her give the interaction, and he said, if, you know, renounce Jesus effectively, and she said no. And everybody thinks I would be the one doing that until we get confronted with it. And then we realize, oh, I'm not really who I thought I was. I guess maybe not. You know, it's not to that extreme. But, you know, who, what you believe is demonstrated by how you act. And she acted in a way that her life was on the line. She believed it. And she said, I'm not denouncing him. No, sorry. Do what you got to do. 16 years old, right? Like, that's who I want to be. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And we can look at people that aren't even in the Bible, just great life stories of, of courageous things people have done. It's incredible. And he's rebuking them. They had been with him, and they still refused to believe, even after he, he, he rose, but they didn't believe it. So he said to them, go into all the world. So right in the next verse, even though it didn't disqualify them, he rebuked them. But now he's telling them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes. That's what it's about, right? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. That's a longer teaching to go into the details there. But then verse 17 says, and these signs will follow those who believe. Not believers will follow signs. <laughs> that's not mine. That's Jane Hammond. She used that. And I never forgot it because it's easy. You know, it's easy for that to happen. You start to want to go to so many conferences and follow in the signs. But no, you believe it. And then signs will follow you. Body, the whole body, equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, right? Everybody here has a chance to make a difference for God. And it's not to say we don't love when people come that are, that, are, that are really refined in their gifting and mature in their gifting, but that's not, we're not supposed to compare ourselves to them. We glean from them. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Do you believe that? Yeah. Have you ever done it? Yeah. Good. Do you want to do some more? Yeah. Are you afraid to do it? No. It's okay to say yes. Really? It is. It's okay to say, I don't know. This feels a little risky. I saw the exorcist. <laughs> right? It's a weird world. It, uh, I'm going into things that I don't fully understand, but I love the person and I want them free. And God wants them free. And he doesn't want one to perish. Well, then why doesn't he just do it? <laughs> We're his body. We are the body of Christ. We are in the earth. He's expecting us to operate co-operate with him. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, take up serpents in this um, version. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and hope they recover. <laughs> right? That's what happens, though. How many times have you heard people give a testimony that I prayed for somebody, I didn't believe it, and then I saw them. This is one of Trisha's, actually. 
saw the lady that she prayed for in the, in the food store and was wondering if she should go down the other aisle and try to hope like the lady wasn't going to come and say it didn't work. The lady came up and said, I'm healed. Did I tell it right, hon? Okay. Well, I do get it right once in a while. But like we have less belief in it than, than the person believing for the answer. And now, so that's the thing. It's that we have this unhealthy fear of looking bad. <laughs> right? <laughs> of caring more about what other people think than what God thinks. It's not easy to just be obedient and do it because there's no guarantee you're going to see the results immediately. But that's, that's what faith is, R-I-S-K. That's what John Wimber used to say. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. You're going to step out and try to do something that you don't know if you can do it. Come on, Peter, walk on the water. Really? The man who had the withered hand, stretch out your hand. Well, that's why I'm here. I can't. Stretch it out. In the presence of Jesus, you can. But it seems like he's almost always asking us to do something we don't think we can do. Does that make him mean? It's taking some people a minute to decide what they want to say. <laughs> yeah. No, don't say that. I get it. Feels that way. Randy Clark, you know, that's one of the ways I met Steve, too, was at a Randy Clark conference. And uh, he said... It's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. People would fly in from all over the world to come to his conferences because there was an, 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 uh, a recognizable anointing for healing in his meetings, but not 100% of the people got healed. And you're not, you're human if you just say, I wonder why. Like they came from all over, and that was the agony of defeat part for him. And, and he would call out to the Lord and say, I see them rolling in on wheelchairs, and some are getting up and out, but others are rolling back out on the wheelchair. Was it me? Did I fail somehow? So that's, that's this trust that we have to have in him, that if, if what he said is true and we do it, then that's all he's asking us to do. And do it with faith that he will do it. And stop trying to reason it all out beyond that, because that's a lack of faith. If he said it, I believe it. That's a good way to go. The opposing force, force of faith is unbelief. So this is in, the uh, first one I read was Mark, when he rebuked them for their unbelief. But in John, it also talks about the post-resurrection period. And it says in John 20, 24, Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. The disciples told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails... And then place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand to his side. I will never believe. That's a stronghold. So let's do this. Lord, put your hand on your head. Lord, I tear down every stronghold of unbelief in my thinking. I decree I will take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And on your heart now. <laughs> Lord, if there's any strongholds of unbelief in my heart, I use the weapons of my warfare, which are not carnal, but mighty through God, to demolish strongholds in Jesus' name. This will be a lifetime process. <laughs> if I'm any example, anyway. You can't say, I will never believe, okay? That's what Thomas said. I, I mean, that's the, the, the version I'm reading. And then eight days later, his disciples were with him and again. I'm sorry, were inside again, and Thomas was with them this time. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And if you remember this part of the story, he came in, but the door was locked. So how did he get in? So they might have been a little rattled by that, right? So the first thing he says is, peace be with you. Don't be too rattled. And uh, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do you remember his answer? My Lord, my God. <laughs> right? That's a pretty good answer. That's what the thief on the cross said. Lord, remember me. Lord did. Jesus says, do not disbelieve, but believe. That's that stronghold of unbelief that we have to fight. You believe, Thomas, because you've seen me. 
Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Come on. Come on. You don't need proof other than your testimony. Don't try to overcomplicate it. You know God heals because he healed you. You know God prophesies because somebody prophesied to you. And you know that they had no way of knowing it. It's a demonstration. That's what Paul was saying. I'm not coming with eloquent words. I'm coming to you with a demonstration of the power of God. And we have to have more faith in God's power than in human wisdom. And I'm the American church, it would appear to me, if you read Eric Metaxas' book called A Letter to the American Church, highly recommend it. I may even try to get him as a speaker here to talk about that book because he wrote about Bonhoeffer, who was a Christian who went back and tried to take out Hitler uh, during World War II. And he said the church in Germany that was looking the other way is very similar to the church in America who's looking the other way as the curriculums in the schools are, are, are tur being turned into pornography. And, but we're not going to do anything about it. We're not going to try to join a school board and, and shift that. Well, that's what we're here for. We're here to represent him in the culture. Well, you're not supposed to talk about politics. But I'm supposed to protect my children. So you're going to call me a terrorist, a domestic terrorist, if I come to complain at the school board meeting? No. Where are you going to draw the line? If it's around, if we can't protect our own children, then maybe not believing in politics was a lie from the pit of hell for the church. I'll give up the tax, exempt, exempt, tax exemption. I don't think the Apostle Paul would have been too moved if you said, you know what, Paul, if you say that, we're going to remove your tax exemption. I think he would smack you. What is that? He never even heard of it. I'm out there risking my life every day, and you're worried about your tax exemption? Really? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. But when, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to Luke 8 now. I'm changing it. Remember, Luke is a doctor, right? He's a physician. And I'm still talking about delegated authority in the kingdom. You know it. It says, fear not, only believe. That's the part I want you to just keep in the front part of your brain right now. Fear not, only believe. Could you say it? Fear not, only believe. He was talking to Jairus. I know a lot of you know the story, but that's, for me, something that I never forgot, that the first thing the enemy will use against you is fear. Right? Now, if David had trusted more in human wisdom than the power of God, do you think he would have been running into the battle to faith, face Goliath? You know, if you read it closely, it says he ran to take out that giant. He was so confident in the power of God over the human wisdom that Saul was trying to use and say, you're just a kid. He's a warrior. You don't stand a chance. And David's like, it ain't me he's fighting. It's the God in me that he's fighting. And that's exactly right. And what's so cool about all of this, you know, and it says that, that the, that the treasure of heaven is held in earthen vessels, right? That's how Paul says it. Meaning that we're not fully capable, but yet he still chooses to use us. And part of the humility of it is you couldn't have done it in your own power. But you still cooperated with him. David, in the natural, if they were running odds, the betters would have said no, 100%, no shot. And God loves it when that happens because we don't take the credit. It goes to him. All the glory to him. Yes, I'm going to equip myself. I'm going to study to show myself approved. But you become famous, not me. Amen? We want you. So that's 50. But if we just back up to verse 41 there, it says, There came a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. So it's really funny how when you're in a secular setting and you mention that you're a Christian, at least in this area, people kind of pull back a little bit until they need help with something. <laughs> and then they come knocking at the door and say, hey, you got a minute? You know, and you do. You always have a minute for them, right? Because it's a time of vulnerability. And you were that guy at one time, hopefully. You know, easy to remember what it was like to not have any hope. Or, or that there could possibly be a solution to a problem. And, and that happened often 
in, in the older version of my job in New York City, I was daily surrounded by a lot of unsafe people. Now I'm, I'm able to work remotely, so I'm not in that as much, but we still stay out among the community, amen? You want to be with unbelievers. You want to have a chance for heaven and earth to meet in, in, into the life of that unbeliever or even that new Christian that I met yesterday. I, I'm hoping he'll call me and we'll follow up and, and I can disciple this guy. No strings attached. No donation needed. It's not because I want to get something from him. It's because I have this privilege to disciple a guy who lives in Brooklyn, which is pretty left-leaning. To put it mildly. So this man, uh, he's in the enemy's camp. He's one of the synagogue rulers. They don't like Jesus. But he's desperate enough that he doesn't care what they think about him anymore. He doesn't care what the other Pharisees think. He comes running to Jesus, falls down on his feet, and is begging him because he loves his daughter. And I know we all love our kids. So why are we sending him into the pit of hell, into libraries that have schools, that have books on the shelves, that if you try to read it out loud in the meeting, they shut you down? What if you had a daughter that was in prison for some drug use, and you find out that a guy that was a rapist said that he was now identifying as a woman, and they let the guy into the women's prison? When did this spirit of stupid hit us? He's, identif he's a rapist, and he's identifying as a woman, and you think you should put him in a woman's prison. What happened? How could that? My, I'm telling you, my father would think he landed on Mars. He was born in 1921. It's a little different, 102 years ago. We, we do need a righteous indignation. See this? Not on my watch. Take the stupid tax exemption. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Can you imagine? Did you ever see the chosen scene? Whew, the multitudes were thronging him. And that woman who was on the sidelines in the, in the alley kind of hiding, waiting because she knew if they recognized her, she wouldn't be allowed anywhere near him. You know what I'm talking about? You know the scene? If you haven't seen it, it's really good. I would highly recommend it. Tim showed it here on a Wednesday night. Having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians. Who's the writer of the book? Luke. What was his job? Right. So you can imagine, right? Like he's seeing it in the first person here. Having a flow of blood for 12 years, there's not a man in the, on the planet that would understand what that means, ladies. But you do. Spent all she had. Now this big shot, Jairus, was so desperate to cry out to Jesus. And now this person at the other end of the spectrum who was considered unclean by the culture and wasn't even allowed to really be out in public because she was considered unclean. She could not be healed by any of the physicians. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately, whoo, immediately her flow of blood stopped. 12 years, and in one step, with no prescription, she was healed. I'm not saying don't get prescriptions, but I'm saying let's trust him to be the ultimate healer. Amen? Did everybody get a handout on the way in? I wasn't good about telling the ushers to give the handout on the way in. There's, a, there's some healing scriptures on the back table. If you didn't get it, good. Grab it on the way out. These are things that I like to do. Alex still has some in the back there. I don't want to distract that, but while you're fasting and praying, right, they go together, fasting and praying. This kind of devil, this kind of unbelief only comes out by prayer and fasting. It's really good to meditate on scriptures. And, and speak them out into the atmosphere. Jesus said, who touched me? You know the story. When they all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? Jesus said, somebody touch me, for I perceive power going out from me. So somebody was also touched by me. <laughs> There's a song. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that fills my soul. You know that one? 
something happened and now do you know he touched me and made me whole you're hired <laughs> now when the woman saw that she was not hidden woo, she had to hide she was considered unclean but now uh-oh my goose is cooked she came trembling and falling down before him she declared to him in the presence of all people the reason she had touched him and how she was immediately healed see just like that man dropped all his his worries about what other people would think she's like you know what i'm not unclean anymore i'm allowed to be among you people and he said to her daughter be of good cheer your faith ha your belief, your trust, beyond the human wisdom of the doctors, your faith is what made you whole. You believed it, and now you see it. Not you have to see it first, like Thomas, and then believe it. And while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, your daughter's dead. Do not trouble the teacher. And if we're just honest, we would say, yeah, well, if you didn't stop for that woman... That's the human wisdom again, <laughs> right? That's the human wisdom. It's her fault. When Jesus heard it, he said, fear not. You just got a bad report. Fear not. Could be any one of us here, right? Prostate, men get older, no symptoms, go to the doctor and find out, well, you know, PSA level's a little high, yada, yada, yada. Fear not. Only believe. Let that be the circuit breaker. Whatever the word is that's coming, fear not. It's the main weapon the enemy uses because he's such a good liar. If he was a bad liar, you wouldn't get as afraid. He's a good liar. He's the father of liars. So he knows how to do this well. So if you don't know the word, it is written, Satan. That's what Jesus said when he was being tempted in the wilderness. Don't say it was written by the New York Times, Satan. It's written in the word of God. Then that's much better than the New York Times and any other paper. And when he came into the house, here's another kingdom key right here. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Because he wanted people praying with him who knew that he could do this, who believed that he could do it. That's not to uh, discriminate against those other people, but if they weren't ready yet, he didn't want them in the room. Because there's a power of unbelief that could slow down the power of God. 54, he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and said this big, long prayer. Little girl, arise. <laughs> little girl, arise! Maybe not. Maybe it's just like took her by the hand and said, little girl, arise. I was present in your mother's womb when you were conceived. And this is not your time. <laughs> and then her spirit returned. She arose immediately, and he said, give her something to eat. Pretty practical. I'm going to just cut ahead a little because of the time. You used the word perspective this morning, and it really rung true with me. And that's what I'm calling this little section, and I'm almost done. The perspective of redemption in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he endured God's testing. And I'm going to stop there because we don't like that word, do we? We don't like the testing word, but, but if we're honest, we should just understand that when you love somebody and you want to give them authority, you have to... Make sure that they have the authority that you, that they understand what you're asking them to do. So use the military. If, if somebody was going to be trained to be a pilot, they would have to be trained and tested, and they would have to have a co-pilot in there with them before they get behind that F-16 by themselves. There's nothing wrong with this. This is what a good father does. He, he trains us. He teaches us. It's a back and forth. And Nobody gets it right 100% of the time, but there's a learning. But it says he endured God's testing, so there was there were stages in it. And if you just think about it quickly, in Genesis 15, we know that God said, look up in the sky, your descendants are going to be more numerous than the star. But he's an old man, and he doesn't have any air at the time. Like, how's that going to be? I choose God's power over man's wisdom. Don't try to figure it out, Abraham. And he did it. He said, well, if God said it, okay. And then in verse 17, we find out that 
you know, they're 190 years old at the time. 100 for Abraham, 90 for Sarah. And she laughed, right? Like, it's okay. She laughed. She didn't believe it. But then in, in Genesis 22 is when we find out that he's actually got the knife in the air and ready to take his life, his son's life. The very promise. You talk about having to compete against human wisdom. Well, I want you to sacrifice your son. No, that can't be God. That's got to be the devil. This is the promise. Well, look, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by the proceeding, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So that's why we do so many weeks on prophetic and discernment and listening and knowing how to separate the voice of your flesh from the voice of the Lord. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he endured God's testing, offered his beloved son Isaac as a sacrifice. The very one, Abraham, who received God's promise was willing to offer his only son. God had told him, it's through Isaac that your descendants will bear your name. And he concluded that God was capable of raising him from the dead. <laughs> and this is a tricky one here. Thank you, Steve Swanson. Which figuratively, figuratively is indeed what happened. I know it's 1221, and some of you want coffee. What did that mean? Figuratively, it's what happened. Well, okay, it might be that just he was so close that God raised him from the dead because he stopped him from doing it. But I don't know. I have a feeling in Abraham's mind it was like, wait a minute. Why am I hung up about this child? He was a miracle to begin with. So if he was a miracle to begin with, why couldn't God just raise him from the dead anyway? And that helps us keep perspective about who we are. Because I'm a miracle standing here in front of you right now. I should have been dead a long time ago. So who am I to challenge God when I know he's telling me to do something? Yeah, but I need to put out another fleece. And I'm on number 74. <laughs> right? We can relate. We question with man's wisdom the power of God, and I don't want to do that. And this is my last slide. And everybody said amen. <laughs> Faith for salvation and discipleship. And I, I can't do justice to the idea that there's this disagreement between Paul, who says you're justified by faith, and James is said, yes, but I want to see your faith. <laughs> right? Fair enough? Is that an easy way to think about it? And I think it's not that hard to understand both because Paul's mostly talking about the way you get right with God is by faith alone. But once you're right with God, you're, you're going to want to act. Right, Ray? Like how many hours yesterday? You got there at 7 o'clock. I was already texting him at 7, and he didn't leave till what, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. And then he was here again this morning. Like, he's doing something. Doing is not earning not trying to earn anything with God. He's taking action on his faith. People that got saved in Nebraska watching that video, he's connected to that, right? All we do is show up and open the door and then see what God's going to do. And showing up and opening the door is a pretty good deal too. Not that easy, right, Carolyn? You keep that door open in Patterson and miracles just because you had the vision to go do it. What about Abraham, our father? Wasn't he shown to be righteous through his actions? I like that translation because some translations say, wasn't he justified by his actions, which makes it look like he was trying to earn it. But no, he was just shown to be righteous because once you get saved, you want to be obedient to the father. Jesus said, as the father sent me, so I'm sending you. And if I was sent to destroy the works of the devil, so are you. He's not giving you a higher rank because you do more. He's allowing you to participate with him in miracles. Wow. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And I could love somebody enough to have authority to cast a demon out of them. And once that happens, they're never the same again. Amen. Can we stand? It goes on to say his faith was at work along with his actions. His faith was made complete by his faithful actions. Anybody ready to quit this church because I'm, I'm a heretic right now? Okay. Because some people feel really strongly about this, that if you promote any kind of actions, you're trying to tell people they can earn favor with God. And I, you know, I've heard that argument too long. You know, 
I'll talk to anybody about this because I really feel strongly that we're not earning. He doesn't mind effort. He doesn't want our motivation to be that we think we can earn more love. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. Nothing. He already loves you more than you even realize. If you got a 50% increase of the understanding how much he loved you, your brain would melt. No, I'm not. I'm kidding. You wouldn't melt. You need to get that because it's unlimited how much he loves us. And once you know that and, you're, and your motive is not what those religious people were saying, you're going to burn in hell if you got hit by a bus tonight. Now, look, I'm sorry to... I don't mean to mock it because people that are out evangelizing, their heart is to get people saved, okay? But they should also, though, hear some feedback that it's just, like, overwhelming to the people who are hearing it when you don't even know me and you're telling me I'm going to burn in hell for eternity. So let's, let's talk about a relationship with God, not, not a fire insurance policy. Abraham's faith was made complete by his faithful actions. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and God regarded him as righteous. Isn't that cool? It was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham, you're in right standing with me because you passed the test. You were willing to put your son up on the altar. That was the very representation of, your, of the promise I was given you because you believed, just like I resurrected your body to have the baby in the first place, that you could resurrect him too. So you leave things on the altar that you really value because you're trusting God for everything else you need. And then the ending here is what's more, Abraham was called God's friend. I am a friend of God? What? That sounds presumptuous. I'm just reading the Bible. We are part of this Abrahamic covenant, aren't we? Anybody here a son of God, daughter of God? That should be your first identity. I'm a child of the living God. Sons and daughters, fully loved. Lord, if you don't go, I don't want to go. If you're not with me, I don't want to go. I want to see what Steve's saying today. I, I, I want to see what you see. Say what you say. Do what you do. And be obedient. Obedient sons and daughters with the faith to believe for miracles. And we're believing for miracles today, right now. There's people here who need healing. I'm not going to yell and scream about it, but I am going to pray with you if you need prayer for healing. And there's a whole, can we get the prayer ministry team up here now? There's a whole group of people here that will stand in agreement with you and won't talk about your business, okay? Like, you don't have to be worried. If they're on this team, that means we trust them to keep everything confidential. And, and the enemy is so good at using shame to try to stop us from opening our mouth. But I say no. I say no to the enemy's plan to try to shame you. It's time to just say, Lord, I need your help. I can't do this on my own. I need your help. I'm confused. Trisha and I both separately, we didn't know each other, but we reached that point where, you know, we said nothing else I'm doing is working, so I'm going to try this because these people that are talking to me about it really believe in it, even though I don't fully get it. But, but the Holy Spirit will come. Can you lift your hands? Let's everybody just lift our hands. We say, Holy Spirit, come right now and make yourself real to people in this room and those that are watching online. Let them know the true love, not the, not the confusion of this world. The, the world keeps on spinning into confusion, a ball of confusion. But you are not that. You are true north. And we say, come Holy Spirit and make yourself real to people in this room. Pour out the love of God on these descendants of Abraham, the, the people who are allowed in, that got grafted in, the wild vine got grafted into the root. And we, and we just thank you, God, for that, for that amazing covenant relationship that we're allowed to be part of now. But those that need healing, Lord, we say your power is present to heal today. Emotional healing, relational healing, physical healing in our bodies. Make the crooked way straight. Whatever needs to be done here, Lord, we say move mightily in your sovereign power. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Everybody said amen. And church, could you just pray? Could you pray that that faith would arise in somebody's heart right now that's in this room, and they would come up this aisle right here where these people are, are coming. Just come up that aisle and get in line. Prayer for salvation, prayer for healing. Whatever you need, God is, is in the business of showing you what his will is for your life. So, Lord, we're grateful. We're gathered in your name. That means you're here. Move mightily in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all.